welcome to Talking with Ted on uh, whatever day of the week it is. And we are going to start a new series today. You can tell this is an odd situation, right? Are we gonna bring in my odd little friend here? Okay, so Florida for Hikers, oddballs. You know any oddballs? How do you find oddballs? Especially this time of the year, huh? What do you think? We do what? You look in the mirror. Oh, the have to point it the right way. Thank you. All right, so, thank you. I'll get back to you. So, oddballs. Oddball plants? Sure. You know, plants that don't grow on the ground. Plants that eat animals. That's my favorite thing. Why? Because plants rule, animals drool. We're going to see proof of that today. And plants that shoot seeds 50 miles an hour. Can you do that? Not even you can do that, right? And of course, lots of them make food out of thin air, which is a very cool thing, but most plants do that because they have chlorophyll. All right, this and so much more. So we're gonna break down the numbers. We have a problem, 4,000 species of plants in Arizona. Now I'm assuming that hikers out there hiking among all these plants have some interest in what's going on around them. And you won't see that many animals. You will see plants, thousands, all the time. So having a, some awareness of what they are is gonna be helpful and it's gonna enrich and enhance your hiking experience. Okay, that's what we're about. So we're gonna break down this number of 4,000 into smaller manageable units. How do we do that? Well, families is one way like sunflower family, rose family, pea family, etc. You could talk about just plants from particular habitat, chaparral, alpine summits. Okay, so that's another possibility. We're gonna do that. Or you could talk about um, plants of a particular habit, trees, wildflowers, or location, just a superstition wilderness. So all of these approaches we are going to incorporate, but we're gonna start with oddballs. There are some plants out there that are just so weird and in small family groups that you could just spot them. And once you know them just because they are so weird, then you can learn them just right then without having to get into too much nitty gritty detail, okay? So that's what we're gonna start with, all right. So they're small families. They are of course still in plant families, but they're small. And there are some that are rather spiny. Now, just because a plant is spiny does not mean it's a cactus. None of these plants are cacti. We're gonna cover cacti in their own family group. First, palm trees. All right, palm trees are not common in Arizona. Uh, they are unusual. They only grow in a couple of spots. Kofa Wildlife Refuge has a place called Palm Canyon. We talked about that place in our series on hiking in the desert, okay? So we have one native palm, fan palm. Now, palms are common in the tropics, date palms and all kinds of other things and other places in the old world, Middle East, so forth, all right? We have one native palm, it's a fan palm, California fan palm, so Joshua Tree National Park is another place where you will see these giant trees in their native setting. 60 feet tall, two foot trunk, the leaves are six feet long, three feet wide. You cannot mistake a palm, and you've seen palms, you know, they go through Phoenix or something like that. They're all over the place, different kinds. Okay, they do have a small flower and a big panicle, a big cluster, and dark fleshy fruits, kind of like a small plum, okay? So you don't normally really see that, you just see this ginormous uh, tree. All right, so palm trees, easy to identify. I'm gonna mention, you have to throw in some scientific names of the genus, just so you are accurate in what you're talking about. Washingtonia is the genus for California fan palms, okay? All right, palm trees. Next, there are plants that grow in a basal cluster of leaves, okay? Several different groups. So with agave family is a big one and it includes agave, century plant, and yucca. Now these plants 
especially agaves are pretty weird. So you have these very stiff leaves, stiff spine at the end, a, a margin of prickles along the edge of the leaf. These are nasty plants. Now I was told in my college days how to torture people with agaves. What they did, this is, they actually, mostly actually did this. They would tie a person over one of these plants that had started to send the stalk up and the stalk would grow through them. Now don't look for that on YouTube, okay? I don't think you'll find it. That's an old thing. Um, agave, century plants. Now the other, other thing with century plants, I know it's Christmas, but you know, this is kind of an interesting aspect to these weird plants. Um, they flower, they'll send up this giant stalk, 20 feet in the air. The flowers can be arranged in a wide open uh, cluster or a very tight cluster. And that helps, that's very important with identifying them. However, they don't flower for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And so you get to know them in these, based upon these clusters, okay? Once they flower, they are dead, okay? That's weird, it's an all or nothing. Now I did bring a, some specimens of agaves, okay? These are tiny little pups, all right? So uh, sometimes when they send up that flowering stock, the flowers are useless, the seeds are sterile. And so you'll actually get new plants growing up in the stock. And then when the stock eventually falls over, the plants take root somewhere where they fall over and they grow a new plant that way. Or the mature plant will send out runners and start new plants that way. That's how I've got a couple of these from my yard. Great security around the border of your property along the fence line, okay? Agave, century plant. Tequila is made from the heart that's fermented of agave, okay? So this is an economically an interesting plant as well. All right, yuccas. All right, yuccas in the same group. It's the agave family, notice. The leaves are still pretty stiff, very useful plant. They would make fibers in the indigenous people's uh, primitive days where they would make baskets and all kinds of things. There's no prickles on the margin, uh, but the tip, pointy, um, interesting. So uh, the, the soap was made from roots and the fruits and the flowers are edible. I have not been able to eat fruits from these things in my yard yet. Um, but I have eaten flowers of several species. So uh, they don't flower every year, but they flower again and again and again. They don't die once they flower. So a whole different situation. All right. The next, and, so, and they usually don't have a trunk, but some of the yuccas have a trunk, Joshua tree. And we've got a picture in there and it'll grow a big, huge tree and thick trunk. And uh, the leaves aren't in a basal rosette, but they're in a whirl around the stem. You cannot miss these plants. They are weird looking, okay? And that's why we're presenting them just as oddities, oddballs in and of themselves, okay? No more oddballs in person. All right, next, we have the lily family, all right? And so we have a thing called bear grass, and it has a stalk with a bunch of little tiny flowers on it. The leaves are thinner than the yucca, and very flexible, like a grass. It is not a member of the grass family, it's a member of the lily family, but it'll have these big bushy uh, bases and they send these flowering stalks up and year after year, this will flower. And it is just rather, again, distinctive. You will often find this in juniper, woodlands, and chaparral, okay? And we have pictures of the plant and the close-up of the flowers. Next is in the same lily family, desert spoon. Dacelyron is the genus. I didn't mention the genus in bear grass, Nolina, okay? Desert spoon, Dacelyron, man, this is one of the nastiest plants you will ever have to deal with. So it's, it's a kind of a cross between the agave and the uh, bear grass where the leaves are very flexible, but they're about as wide as the yucca, but they have nasty prickles all along the margin and you just, very fibrous, very tough. You cannot do anything with these without getting ripped to shreds. The flowering stalk they shoot up every year is a tight uh, spike instead of being open like in the bear grass, okay? They stand out distinctive. You're not gonna confuse them with other things. Finally, in this 
group of plants with this base of uh, cluster of leaves is Live Forever. Don't you love the name of that plant? It's like aloe vera, okay? Only it's a different species. It's in the panda plant family, named after an animal, isn't that cute? Crassulaceae is the family. The genus is Dudleya. That's kind of a weird name. But it's got bright red flower stalk. The leaves are fleshy like an aloe vera. Uh, spring flowering. Uh, it's very unusual to see it. It's not that common. You'll find it in desert and rock uh, crevices. The picture I have there is from Death Valley. Um, so it's pretty special to find these. And they're in a source superstitions, an Oregon Pike Cactus National Monument. And so they're widespread, but you're not gonna see very many of them. When you do see one, it's pretty cool because it's uncommon. All right, that's the end of our basal leaf cluster plants that are odd because they're just, and you're just gonna find them and recognize them because they're distinctive, okay? Next. Ocotillo. All right, now Ocotillo, sometimes called a living fence. It's actually in its own family, like with boojum trees. And so it's kind of weird. And so I've got a picture there of these uh, spines. So when you get a new stem section growing out, you'll get uh, these little petioles with the little leaf at the end. And then when it dries out, these are uh, drought deciduous plants when they dry out the leaves fall off and all you have left are the spines you can stick that in the ground and a new plant will begin to grow roots and you can you'll see these down I've seen them down busy where I'm from you get they, they cut off the stems because it's a big huge bunch of wands the, the branches and so and they'll cut them off stick them in the ground line them up with wire and pretty soon you've got a fence and that is a nasty Fence. You're not going to climb over it. You're not going to jump over it. You're not going to do anything with it. Uh, and so when it rains, then it will leaf out again at the base of the spine. And then when it dries out, then the leaves fall off and it waits for more rain. So lots of trees in the desert do this. Palo Verdes, for example, dry out, leaves fall off because the stems are green. And those, there's green in the stems here too. So it can continue to photosynthesize, making food out of thin air. That's a miracle, okay? Green things are cool. Our friend the Grinch, all right? Appreciates, there's only two things you need to know about the Grinch, besides it being odd, okay? So he's green, color of abundance. Notice the resemblance here. And he's very misunderstood, okay? True, all right. So, Ocotillo, and next, the one thing about Ocotillo that I do want to mention is that red tubular flowers, they are pollinated by hummingbirds. They like them. They are edible. And I have eaten them, and they're not palatable. They have a dryness, a stringent uh, property to them that will dry out your mouth terribly. And so it's just not worth it. I've never felt or tasted them to be sweet like other red tubular flowers uh, in the desert and mountains. Okay. But they are distinctive. You're not going to confuse them with anything else. Again, they are not a cactus, even though they are covered with spines. All right. Now we're going to talk about two other groups of plants. These are parasites. Some of these parasites grow on the ground. All right. So they are no longer green, mostly. One of them is kind of green. Um, so they get their food like we do from other organisms. All right. Now they have a very special, these ones that grow on the ground, relationship with fungi and so there's fungi in the soil fungus among us okay some people think this guy's a fun guy kind of like a fun gus you know and then the fungi draw in nutrients from other plants that are being parasitized shrubs uh, trees perhaps and so uh, that's how these plants they are flowering plants they'll have fruits uh, sometimes fleshy sometimes not but they are uh, not green. And so they stand out, they're colorful. This one, Orobonchi, can either be, oh, well, the family Orobonchi, A-C-E, uh, the purple desert ones, all right? And you'll see them under bushes, you'll see this purple thing sticking up, these little stems. It's like, what's that? Well, it's Orobonchi. Uh, broom rape is a common name. Cancer root is a common name for a different genus, Conopholis. 
which grows a little higher elevation, kind of a yellowish one. Uh, at least the desert purplish one is edible. I have not eaten it. When the new shoots come up out of the ground, that's when it is supposed to be edible. Once it gets older, it's tougher, and it's just not palatable. All right. The Orobanchi family. There's only a couple of species of these uh, in the southwest and uh, very curious looking. Next, we have a small group of orchids in Arizona, coral root orchid, and another one called Hexelectris. Corolla rises, a genus of the coral root, and Hexelectris is the other one, and they uh, work with the fungi again. They connect with the fungi, which connects with the pine trees, and they draw nutrients from the trees. They're like buddies, you know. Uh, and the other thing that's curious about orchids is they are upside down, okay? So when they flower, the flowers develop, and so it comes out, little tiny flowers in this case, brownish purplish stems, and the flowers are resupinate in orchids, all orchids, I believe and they'll twist and they actually end up upside down so that the lip on there kind of helps as a platform for pollinators to come in there. So purplish, brownish uh, stems just coming up out of the ground, no leaves on any of these plants because we need leaves for because they don't photosynthesize. All right, so that's the orchids, the orobonchies, and then we have a, a plant called pine sap and pine uh, drops. Now the pine sap, the genus Monotropa, the pine drops, the genus Pterospora, higher elevations, pine forests, so they're going to parasitize with the fungi, the conifers up there. Uh, the pine sap will have bright red, usually in the spring when the snow is melting, you'll see these red stems coming up. <clears throat> They'll kind of lean over and then when they are maturing, then they'll open up and stand up straight, and the flowers then will mature when they're standing up straight. Okay, the pine drops, smaller flowers, but the flowers are still drooping. These plants are related closely to the heather family, like rhododendrons and manzanita. Okay, so that's their relationship. They're not in the same family. Depends on how you slice it and dice it. Some of these plant systematists or taxonomists like to split things up and they put them in their own family so we're not going to get wrapped up in that all right so those are the parasites on the ground next parasites on other plants these are epiphytes arizona doesn't have much in the way of epiphytes in the tropics they have pitcher plants and the bromeliads the pineapples uh, plants and they'll just sit up in the branches of the trees and it's humid enough that they can just derive moisture from the air and the of uh, what they collect from the rain that's constant, or at least seasonally. These parasites that we have, the mistletoes, all right, so we have the wide greenish ones, so they aren't fully parasites, they are partially able to photosynthesize. White berries, probably toxic, you don't want to eat these. Uh, the traditional, a lot of Norse mythology with these, that these plants are weird. They could not figure out how this plant, during the harshest time of the year, could still be green, evergreen, and produce fruit. So they considered it to be powerful and magical, and they sometimes worshiped them as sacred. So mistletoe, kissing under the mistletoe, that's all kind of went together back then. Okay, some things uh, continue. All right, now the, the desert species, dwarf mistletoe with the red berries, these are so tiny, but they are edible, and I've eaten them, but they're so small, it's just too much work, but FYI, they are edible. Red berries, dwarf mistletoe from uh, the trees in the desert, uh, Palo Verde, ironwood, mesquite. And oftentimes these plants were classified by ancient peoples by what plant they were growing on, oaks or whatever, okay? And they were considered like if they were growing on oaks, even more powerful. All right, and there's another uh, parasite of this family called uh, what's it called? Arsithobium, and it's on like pine trees mostly. A little yellow branch sticking out of a pine branch, okay? That's not the pine plant. That's a whole separate plant in and of itself. A parasite, Arsithobium, dwarf mistletoe, okay? Now, the cool thing about that, uh, these mistletoes, usually birds 
eat the seeds and poop them out and that gets them established in other branches on the woody trees. Uh, well, sometimes they just get a little impatient and the pressure builds in these fruits and it explodes 50 miles an hour. You ever have a seed spitting contest? I bet you never spit seeds that fast. Don't try it, the Grinch. Have you ever spit? No, never did. All right, the last uh, plant uh, in the group, parasites on plants, is dodder, D-O-D-D-E-R, the genus Cuscata. And it's also a vine, morning glory family, and it twines this yellow mass of, you'll be driving down the desert or hiking through there, and you'll see all these like cobwebby things growing on the plants. Little tiny white flowers, and it's a parasite on the plant, Cuscata. Okay, so what else is left? All right, one, this is my favorite one. You knew I was gonna save the best for last. All right. This is the only carnivorous plant in Arizona. All right, so imagine this. It's an aquatic plant, and it has a little flower stalk, sticks up above like a snapdragon-y thing. It's got a little spur, or um, uh, like a little branch of the flower sticking out of it, okay? So, uh, and if you were swimming in this pond and you would feel these like ticklish little hairs under the water, and you go, what's that? And then when you hit those hairs, you brush against them, it's a trap door. It opens, causing suction, and it pulls you into the bladder, closes behind you, and digests you alive. Plants rule, animals drool. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, if you were the size of a mosquito larvae, don't worry if you're bigger than that. Bladder wart, U. Tricularia is the genus. Very cool, probably deriving more nutrients in the aquatic environment than in the soil, so they've got to su supplement it with animals. <laughs> Poetic justice. All right, final word, oddballs. You're gonna see other oddballs out there. Maybe you're going to see the Grinch. The Grinch was spotted on the trail, Scottsdale, recently. Huh. Okay, he got some thumbs up from the other hikers. You may see a couple people just sort of dancing across a, a log, a tree that's fallen down over a span of several, like 20 feet up in the air. And that's just odd, but that's okay. You may see that out there. Finally, the last picture we have is a rattlesnake under a rock behind bed straw. You're poking around in some of these plants and you're not paying attention, you may find an oddball that you don't want to find. So heads up, keep your eyes open, but the oddballs out there of whatever form are going to enhance and enrich your experience. Keep your mirror handy so you can look in it and keep hiking. We'll see you next time.